addressing them in their desired names and pronouns and allowing them to use the spaces that they want to use, sex-specific spaces, is not just an innocent act of kindness, innocent display of kindness and compassion. That is a social transition. Full stop. In fact, the ACLU has said that explicitly in its lawsuits, that changing a, a student's name and pronouns and, and letting them use the, their desired bathrooms is social transition. The difference is that now we know that social transition is iatrogenic, meaning it greatly increases the chance that what would normally, typically, prove to be a passing phase is going to settle as an identity and put a child on a medical pathway. So the, the big challenge, as I see it, over the next couple of years is, is to persuade or, or inform teachers and school administrators that what they think is just a simple act of compassion and inclusivity is an active form of psychosocial mental health intervention for which they are not qualified. You must be some kind of therapist. I am some kind of therapist and I'm about to take you on a journey through the inner wilderness. I've invited brilliant guests from all walks of life to join me as we investigate, illuminate, and inspire transformation in ourselves, intimate relationships, and the social ecosystems we are constellated in. What you are about to hear may surprise you, so hang on to your earbuds for a hefty dose of sanity in a chaotic world. I am Stephanie Wynn, a licensed marriage and family therapist, branching out and building bridges between psychology and everything else under the sun. It's my honor to have you along for the ride. Let's get started. Today, I'm honored to interview Lior Sapir. He is a political scientist, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He's written for several publications, including City Journal, Reality's Last Stand, Quillette, National Review, and Wall Street Journal, as well as been on many podcasts. Lior is such a wealth of knowledge on the topic of gender, uh, both the, at the micro and the macro level of what's happening with policy, what's happening with science, and how we got here. So I'm really excited to pick Lior's brain today. Lior, welcome to the show. Thanks, Stephanie, for having me. All right. So, Lior, you are great at tracking the details, in my opinion, <laughs> of what's been going on with the gender stuff. You've done a lot of work uh, investigating legal cases, looking at studies on pediatric gender transition. You've debunked uh, some of the work of Jack Turbin, for instance, but you're also a big picture person and you have been working on connecting the dots of how we got here, how we got to this place of institutional capture, where now we're in this massive crisis, especially in the US, but all over the world, but we're gonna talk about the US today, I think. Um, we're in this, this crisis where uh, children's lives are on the line, human rights are on the line. Um, let's explore how we got here. Where should we begin? Well, uh, any place we begin is going to be somewhat arbitrary because, um, you know, this, uh, this development has a lot of threads that it pulls together. Um, and each one of these threads, uh, you could trace back decades, if not centuries. Um, you know, I don't just mean kind of the philosophical thoughts behind um, the new theory, the new philosophical anthropology of transgenderism. Um, I also mean developments in law and institutions um, that um, that uh, advocacy organizations were very uh, skilled at building on in order to promulgate the the policies that we have. Um, but let me, I, I think a, a good place for us to start would probably be uh, with the first term of the Obama administration. Uh, and we're talking about 12, 13 years ago. Um, before I say anything, let me just... Um, apologize to your listeners for my voice today. I'm getting over a head cold, so I sound a little bit nasal. Um, so hopefully that won't, that won't be too you much sound of, a fine to me. of a nuisance. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'd say prior to 2013 or 14, pretty much nobody was talking about transgender issues. The word itself had barely registered in popular uh, mainstream discussions. Um, and you know, it's it, 
there's always a temptation to think about these social changes um, in an organic way. And I think that that temptation itself comes out of the civil rights era um, in which African-Americans, after a century of the failed promises of reconstruction, um, started to demand their rights, as was their due. Um, and you know that movement began in the black churches of the South and very quickly spread throughout the United States. And it was an organic movement. Um, obviously, there were uh, whites involved, uh, civil rights leaders, politicians um, involved in, in promoting it, but it was predominantly led by African Americans and the descendants of slavery. Um, and that is partly what what gives the civil rights era and the civil rights movement and the civil rights policies and institutions that, um, that are the legacy of that era, its legitimacy, the fact that it was organic. Um, so there's, a, I think, an equal temptation to try to read that kind of organic development into the transgender revolution. But I think that that um, is misguided. And I think that the, the history and the facts uh, strongly support um, my belief that it's misguided. Um, I mean, just to start with what should be obvious, um, transgender people are such a tiny minority of the population. Um, unlike African Americans, who are you know 13% of the population today, or even, uh, or to say nothing of you know women, uh, the women's rights movement, who are 51% of the population, or even um, gays and lesbians, who are about three or four percent of the population. Transgender people, you know, setting aside. Uh, Generation Z, which is a phenomenon into itself that we can talk about, but transgender people have always been, you know, at the margins of the margins of the margins of society. They've had in and of, you know, in, in and of itself that that subgroup has virtually no electoral power. Um, and so, uh, you know, a, a mass mobilization of transgender people, you know, a, a, so to speak, a, a transgender march, march on Washington um, would have been um, meaningless. Um, historically speaking. Um, again, simply because of numbers, to say nothing of any other um, relevant factor that uh, determines social or political power. So this was very much what some critics like to call an elite-driven revolution. Um, that may sound a little bit cynical to some people, and I understand that, but um, th the basic insight here is that um, once the American state, or I should say the reformers of the 1960s, had created all of these structures within our state and federal system um, in the wake of and as a response to the civil rights movement, it became much more feasible for transgender rights activists, rather than to start an organic mobilization from below, to simply try to tap into some of these um, processes, some of these structures um, that have already been put in place that were already to some extent kind of going on autopilot and to make the, uh, the case to the relevant policymakers, the relevant decision makers, whether bureaucrats in the Department of Education or federal judges, that they were very similar to African Americans under Jim Crow, and that any policy or program that applies to one should apply to the other um, by force of that analogy. And that's largely the story of how we got the transgender revolution in American politics and policy. So that's just kind of from a very broad perspective. So let me get into the, the details, some of the more granular level um, developments. Um, okay, so to take us back to about 2009, 2010, um, there was a problem with bullying in schools during this time. Right? You could say that there still is, but um, the advent of social media and smartphones and the fact that teenagers were increasingly able to use these devices meant that bullying now became a problem that was no longer limited to the, you know, to the four walls of the classroom. Um, it was something that for teachers as well as parents became much harder to monitor and control, both in terms of preventing and in terms of addressing the effects of harassment and teasing and bullying. Um, and in 2010, the Obama administration, the White House, convenes a conference um, at the direction of Arne Duncan, who was then the Secretary of Education, um, that's supposed to address bullying. Now, one of the problems historically with addressing bullying is that a lot of what we would consider to be bullying is verbal. 
right? Um, this is not really about physical bullying and intimidation. This is about, primarily about verbal um, uh, harassment. Um, and the problem is that the Supreme Court has long recognized st strong First Amendment protections that apply to schools. Um, the Supreme Court has also said, and other courts have also said, that you know, if you start policing student speech, um, that very quickly bleeds into a kind of um, silencing of legitimate questions that are sometimes hard to hear, um, difficult to grapple with, but, but that are essential for any functioning democracy. In other words, you don't want to raise a generation of thin-skinned students because uh, democracy requires a thick skin, and that means that students have to be exposed to robust, vigorous, and sometimes offensive discussion. Um, so there was always a reluctance to impose speech codes on schools um, because it was always thought to be at odds with um, the, kind of the, the kind of civic education that's required for democracy. Why is that important? Because in 2010, the White House recognize that bullying is a problem and that our existing laws make it very difficult to address that problem. And so um, they basically constructed a workaround. They said, you know, we can't really treat this as a speech issue, but if we treat it as a civil rights issue, as a matter of discrimination, then we can tap into existing civil rights laws and, and institutions in order to try to regulate schools in a way that reduces bullying. And I should also point out that they defined bullying very broadly, much more broadly than I think most of us would, would agree is, is a good idea. Um, but it basically included any form of comment, any form of verbal communication that to anyone felt subjectively unwelcome. That's it. I mean, that's, that's a, 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 not only is that an extremely broad and vague definition of bullying that encompasses pretty much any speech that anybody uh, anywhere doesn't like, um, but it also goes uh, um, against what the Supreme, how the Supreme Court has defined um, harassment, I should say, um, sex-based harassment, which has to be objective and pervasive um, and, and, um, and something that really deprives someone, not just limits their ability to learn, but really deprives them of an educational opportunity. So the Office for Civil Rights under the Department of Education and the Obama administration said, um, we're going to define bullying as harassment, which is a kind of a bizarre um, thought, right? We're going to, uh, bullying, we would think, as, uh, is, is something that's worse than harassment. But OCR said, no, no, we're going to define bullying as harassment. And if it rises to the level of harassment, um, then we can consider it within the broader framework of, in this case, Title IX, and use the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, as well as a few other tools, to try to address it. So that is where um, a lot of, of what we're seeing today unfold, with regard, especially with regard to children and schools and Title IX, and even gender-affirming care, to some extent. We can make that link a little bit later in our conversation. Um, that's where it starts. It starts in these anti-bullying initiatives that originally had very little necessarily to do with um, transgenderism per se. Well, this is great. Thank you for laying things out so sequentially at, at the micro and macro levels. I, I do want to just share one thought that's on my mind, which is the value of a code of conduct mm -hmm. and how from a naive perspective, you know, just coming at this as someone who doesn't know much about this, I'm mm -hmm. hearing this and I'm thinking, well, why shouldn't a school have a code of conduct just like a workplace has a code of conduct mm -hmm. if, if schools and parents share the responsibility of helping scaffold the development of children until they can be independent, responsible adults, then wouldn't following rules be a part of that? Mm -hmm. Parents have certain expectations and there are consequences for breaking those expectations. If you punch your sister, you're not getting dessert or screen time, right? So, you know, from a naive perspective, I'm thinking, why should it be so controversial to have a code of conduct but at the same time, when I start thinking about the reality of how insidious and complicated bullying can be, you know, I'm thinking, again, from that naive perspective that I see nothing wrong with a code of conduct. There should be certain rules and expectations. But then when I think about the he said, she said, and the trickiness of the drama triangle of figuring out 
you know, in any given moment, who's the victim rescuer and perpetrator and, and how are people shifting roles? I see how it's actually very tricky to enforce um, any, any code of conduct, no matter how straightforward that code of conduct is on its surface. And when it comes to things like harassment, and you haven't gotten into this yet, I'm sure you will, but the concept of quote unquote hate speech, again, from a naive perspective, just thinking as if I know nothing about this, I think, well, why don't our laws against harassment uh, and threats of violence suffice? Why do we have to define hate speech as you know, targeted based on demographics? How about just if you say you're going to hurt someone, that's illegal. You can't do that. doesn't matter why you said it, right? right? So that's just kind of where my mind is going with this. Do you have any commentary on yeah. that before you continue? It's a great question. I mean, you're certainly right that we need rules, um, procedures, ex I think maybe to put it a different way, to set clear expectations, um, obviously for students in, in the classroom and you know, what constitutes um, good behavior, appropriate behavior, and what doesn't, but also for teachers um, and for other school staff. Um, and you know, I, it would be a mistake to think that schools didn't have these types of rules, both written and unwritten, formal and informal, um, they did, but usually when you get these kind of federal regulations in the name of civil rights, it's because um, uh, bureaucrats um, in the in the federal government um, and um, you know activists in, in a variety of um, advocacy organizations believe that those rules don't reflect the, the the right priorities, or that that they do reflect the right priorities, but they're not being enforced properly. Um, and so let me kind of just. Um, kind of zoom out from your comment and make a, a broader point, which which is what you're bringing up, which I think is really important. And that is um, normally when friction happens um, at the ground level between students or between students and teachers, um, in order for a, a school to respond in a way that we would consider appropriate, they obviously have to take context into consideration. What exactly, what were the comments that were made, but in what context were they made? What, uh, what was the intention of the person making them? Um, how many people made them? Um, were they systematic and pervasive or were they one-off comments? You know, there's so many different questions that give each interaction its unique texture. The problem with these kind of one-size-fits-all rules and regulations that are imposed, especially at the federal level, is that they often ignore context and sometimes deliberately so. And it's important to understand that the, the way in which Americans have come to think about civil rights is um, uh, it, it's really kind of bound up with um, a profound distrust in the authority of local institutions. And that distrust in the case of African Americans and civil rights and racial civil, racial civil rights was 100% justified. Right? because you had um, institutional leaders at the local level abusing laws and, and, and long-standing policies in order to try to deprive African Americans of voting opportunities, employment opportunities, and so on and so forth. So the, 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 the distrust of localism is a very powerful legacy of the civil rights movement, and that is what um, kind of underwrote the Obama administration's decision to intervene in how schools define and, um, and address bullying, or I should say bullying and harassment, because they, they equated those two terms. So let's, just to get back to the, to the story where we left off, um, beginning in 2010, 2011, the Office for Civil Rights started to launch a number of investigations into school districts. Um, some of these investigations were for kids who were bullied or harassed for being gay. Um, but in a number of cases, the students were transgender and they were bullied and harassed by their, by their peers. But what OCR discovered in the context of these investigations was that these students also weren't allowed access into the bathrooms um, or locker rooms of the sex that they identified as being. And so over a period of time, OCR began to think of these two issues as linked, as kind of the harassment and the emotional harm that comes from bullying and harassment and the way in which that harm undermines the ability of a student to benefit from an educational opportunity on the one hand, 
but but also the message that's sent to that student when the school says, no, you're not really a boy. Um, you should be using the girls' bathroom. Now, obviously, for us, you know, when we think about it objectively, these two issues are and should be separate, right? You can say um, with perfect consistency that no student should be bullied or harassed no matter what and for whatever reason, but also that biological sex is real and matters and the fact that we don't want students harassing one another certainly does not require us to treat students in whatever gender they, they claim to be as if they are really of that sex. But in the minds of, of OCR bureaucrats, the two issues were inherently linked. And of course, um, uh, you know, they were in constant communication with um, uh, lawyers on the ground who belonged to organizations like the ACLU, the Transgender Law Center, um, who tried to argue that these issues are intrinsically linked and you cannot separate them. And in fact, that requiring, uh, you know, female to male transitioners to use the female bathrooms is itself a form of harassment of the kind that OCR wants to try to prohibit. So, um, so momentum during these few years was starting to build towards the Obama administration's change of policy. But I should say that at, uh, it wasn't yet clear that the Obama administration was willing to uh, rewrite the meaning of the word sex in, in civil rights laws, especially in Title IX. Rather, what it did was to use the muscle, the organizational power of the Office for Civil Rights to basically try to, well, for lack of a better word, bully school districts into accepting um, its terms. And the way in which it did so is in previous administrations, OCR would respond to um, incidents as they arose. So if you are harassed uh, on the basis of race or sex, you file a complaint, civil rights, Office for Civil Rights, and it investigates and you know, um, comes, comes up with a re resolution, resolution that hopefully um, the school accepts. And if not, you can sue in federal court. Um, the Obama administration around this time started to launch a new strategy for OCR. Rather than respond to individual complaints as they arise, what OCR did was to take these individual complaints, use them as an occasion to launch these, um, what it called systematic investigations of schools. And these are long, and I mean months long, in some cases they were even years long investigations that were extremely expensive and very embarrassing um, because uh, OCR also used its contacts with um, uh, left of center media to draw attention to these investigations. Um, in order basically to uh, apply an enormous amount of public pressure on schools and universities to change their policies. And in that way, they got these, inst uh, these schools and universities to accept what are known as consent decrees, where they agree to uh, um, rewrite their internal policies um, without even uh, um, you know, the benefit of, of uh, having their day in court or anything like that. And so that's how the Obama administration started to use OCR in order to um, cajole school districts into changing how they treat transgender identified students. Now, around 2014, a student in Virginia by the name of Gavin Grimm, um, who's a, a um, female who identifies as male, um, filed a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights after the school board in Gloucester County, Virginia, voted um, that, um, that, that students have to use the restrooms that accord with their biological sex. And um, after the civil rights complaint was filed with OCR, a, um, a, a, trans, a transgender activist lawyer um, in Virginia um, who uses the handle, I think on one of her social media accounts, I think it was on Twitter or something like that, um, sworn, what did she call herself? The sworn knight of the transsexual empire something like that, right? So this was obviously an, an activist lawyer, um, writes a private letter um, to the Department of Education, the Department of Justice, basically asking, you know, here's this case unfolding here. It obviously turns on what sex means under Title IX. Um, please tell me, she's saying to the Office for Civil Rights, please tell me how you plan um, to address this. Um, and I promise to share your response with my allies, she said this explicitly, with my allies at NPR, BuzzFeed, and Metro Weekly, which is a major LGBT ma um, uh, magazine centered in um, DC. 
And, you know, the Obama administration um, for its second uh, term in office launched this big campaign of, you know, kind of trying to um, redo the, uh, the, uh, the base of the Democratic Party to make it more uh, younger, more female, more um, LGBT focused, more socially progressive, meaning to move away from its working class roots of the, of the previous FDR based um, coalition. Um, and so this became, you know, I think, and I'm speculating here, I think for officials within the Department of Education, within the Obama administration, um, they did not want to be perceived as being on the wrong side of this new emerging issue. And this kind of veiled threat by an activist lawyer on the ground that she is going to basically expose the Obama administration as being insufficiently progressive on LGBT issues um, in major media um, uh, outlets, I think was enough to get um, the Obama administration uh, to respond in the way that she wanted. And sure enough, um, that's what they did. Um, so, uh, you know, they basically, uh, there was a, a deputy assistant, I can't, I can't even remember the exact title, but um, some mid-level bureaucrat in OCR wrote um, this lawyer uh, a private response saying, it's my understanding, this is what he said, it's my understanding that anytime these kinds of um, uh, you know, cases come up, schools generally have to treat students in accordance with their gender identity. Now you might ask, what, on what legal basis was this um, OCR bureaucrat uh, sending this letter? Uh, was he citing uh, court cases? The, the answer is that he was. there were two bodies of legal precedents or legal actions that he was citing. Um, one was OCR's own investigations, which I mentioned earlier, which were based on nothing but its own unilater unilateral decision of what constitutes sex-based harassment, right? The other was a body of lawsuits that stretches all the way back to the uh, early 2000s, um, where federal courts said that uh, transgender, I, I should say transsexual, because that's how they call them, transsexual women, meaning male to female transitioners, um, cannot be fired or not promoted at work simply because they are transsexual. In other words, it was a body of case law developed under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which is a very different statute with a very different purpose than Title IX, which is from 1972 and concerns edu education. It was a body of case law that concerns adults, not kids. And it was a body of case law where courts were not required to redefine what sex means. On the contrary, in all of these lawsuits, the way in which courts thought about what it means to be transsexual is that a transsexual woman is really a man who doesn't conform to stereotypes of male appearance and behavior. And courts said this explicitly. So not only did these um, lawsuits not reject the conventional understanding of sex in favor of gender identity. They explicitly assumed the conventional understanding of sex and rejected the, the notion that sex means gender identity. And yet here was an Obama administration um, mid-level bureaucrat citing these cases um, in order to come to the exact opposite conclusion. Okay, fast forward a little bit. Um, Gavin Grimm versus Gloucester County becomes a major federal lawsuit. Uh, in the Fourth Circuit. Originally, uh, the, the school district uh, wins at the uh, district level, and then it gets appealed to the Fourth Circuit. And the Fourth Circuit says, you know what, we're not going to um, define what sex means. All we're going to say is it's an ambiguous term, and because it's ambiguous, we're going to defer to how the Department of Education um, defines the word sex. Now, the Department of Education, any federal agency, when it's going to issue rules, it has to go through something known as a notice and comment procedure. And that's when um, they, they, you know, they propose a rule and the public has an opportunity to comment. And then um, the agency has to go through all the motions and, and look at all the comments and consider them and make revisions in light of them. This is for the sake of accountability and transparency. OCR never did anything of the sort. Right? And the reason it never did anything of the sort is precisely because it said, we're just following case law, um, which it wasn't. So what ended up happening is that the Fourth Circuit deferred to the Office for Civil Rights, which in turn had deferred to a number of federal courts, which never redefined sex in the way that OCR said it, they were redefining sex. And then after the Fourth Circuit issued its, uh, its opinion, the Obama administration a few weeks later comes out with what's known as a Dear Colleague Letter, which is a unilateral guidance document issued by the Office for Civil Rights, 
in which it says from now on, all schools across the country, as a condition of receiving federal funds, must treat transgender students in accordance with their gender identity, not their sex. And what was the legal authority that OCR was citing? The Fourth Circuit uh, Court's opinion. So uh, this is how you get these kind of uh, these revolutions in, in the United States sometimes. It's not through some dramatic march on Washington or some, you know, kind of um, um, activist cabal working behind the scenes or or even a president taking bold action explicitly where everybody knows what the public new, the new program is. Um, very often these revolutions happen through incremental steps where um, uh, bureaucrats, federal judges, and even um, uh, people in activist organizations don't quite see the full picture. They don't quite understand where any of this is going gonna, is gonna to end up. Um, and so it, in this case, uh, you know, um, a, a, a policy program that originated in good intentions to address the problem of bullying in schools ended up with the Obama administration and a number of federal, uh, federal courts reinterpreting what it means to be uh, a male or female human being. Um, and this created extremely powerful pressures on schools, pressures that have not subsided to this day, even uh, despite the fact that the Trump administration tried to undo, and in many cases did undo, a lot of the Obama-era regulations. Um, this created a new type of uh, incentive structure for schools, K through 12 schools, in which, you know, uh, there's just, um, you take an enormous risk by not deferring to however students identify themselves. Um, and that's where we are today. And if we want to understand, you know, there's obviously a lot more to the story, but I'm, I'm giving kind of the gist of it. If you want to understand why so many young people, so many teenagers are um, identifying as trans or non-binary or queer or anything like that and seeking out um, hormones and surgeries. Um, you know, a major part of the story has to do with what's going on in schools. Um, the way in which schools are introducing kids at a very young age to these dissociating concepts of gender identity um, making, uh, confusing them about things that, that they shouldn't even be thinking about, right? Uh, first graders should not be thinking about whether they were assigned the wrong sex at birth. They should be thinking about playing kickball. Um, but when you constantly pump out this, this misinformation to students at such a young age, it's not surprising that, that you're going to see some of them at very early ages start to express confusion, or just even uh, sincere, you know, uh, desires to be or be recognized as, as the opposite sex. And when you have adults, you know, teachers and um, school psychologists and school administrators um, kind of cheering them on, saying how amazing and authentic they are and how it's, it's so brave to be nonconforming and we are your family now and love bombing them and putting up all these signs at school saying how amazing and welcome these uh, young nonconformist students are. Um, obviously, that's going to have an impact too. So um, schools, I think, have very much become a ground zero uh, for a lot of the uh, um, a lot of what we're seeing now with with um, uh, teenagers seeking medical transition procedures. Um, but look, Stephanie, I mean, that, I've, I just told you one of the threads. I you know earlier I said that there's a lot of interlocking threads here, and that's just one of them. Um, I chose that specific one because I wanted to illustrate how these things are not organic, and they often start from inst uh, uh, efforts by um, you know, well-connected um, activist organizations, and by well-connected I mean well-connected among, among among themselves. Let's say you know HRC and Glisten, and um, and the National Center for, for Lesbian Rights, and the ACLU um, uh, are well-connected among themselves, but they're also well-connected with um, bureaucrats within the um, the federal and state agencies, especially depart departments of education, um, and this is really a story of 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 this kind of incremental policy change, where you know institutions take one step um, at a time and arrive at a uh, a whole set of of policy conclusions that they never probably never even predicted they were going to arrive at from the get go. We can also talk, if you want, about how you know while this was going on during the um, first term of the Obama administration, um, a new kind of clinical reality was starting to emerge in the United States and in other countries uh, in the world following from the um, uh, uh, publication of the Dutch research and the Dutch protocol. 
If you were to come to me as a client and tell me you were feeling grumpy, irritable, lethargic, stressed out, or unfocused, I'd want to do a thorough assessment of your lifestyle. And one of the first elements we'd look at is the quality and quantity of your sleep. You need at least a good seven hours of refreshing sleep every night in order to be your best self. There are many things that can get in the way of that. A demanding job, a new baby, or just plain bad habits, for example. But if you're having difficulty falling or staying asleep for the simple reason that you're too hot, you're too cold, or you and your partner don't agree on the temperature, look no further. I have just the thing for you. And since this is not therapy but a podcast, I can actually sell you stuff. So I'm going to genuinely recommend that you check out the Pod Pro Cover by 8 Sleep. It's the most advanced solution on the market for thermoregulation. The cover can adjust the temperature on each side of the bed individually for you and your partner based on your sleep stages, biometrics, and bedroom temperature, reacting intelligently to create the optimal sleeping environment. Personally, I have mine set to run on autopilot so that my bed is warm when I get in, cool in the middle of the night, and warm again when it's time to wake up. I sleep very soundly this way. Improving your sleep is one of the best investments you can possibly make in your overall well-being, the quality of your work, and the lives of the people you touch. So go to 8sleep.com to check out the pod and use the code SOMETHERAPIST at checkout for up to $200 off your purchase. Even if they're already running another sale, this code will get you an additional $50 off. And to my listeners around the world, 8sleep currently ships not only within the USA, but also to Canada, the United Kingdom, select countries in the European Union, and Australia. All right, now back to the show. Wow, Lior, that's brilliant how you followed that one thread and you made it so clear uh, for you know people like me who don't track those details in the same way. Um, you really laid it out there. and and again, I'm thinking from that from that naive standpoint because I think sometimes we can learn new things by approaching with sort of that beginner's mind state. I'm thinking about, you know, I was in middle school and high school in the late 90s. And many of my listeners are as well, based on the you know demographics data I get from YouTube and Transistor. Um, you know, a lot of our audience are in their 30s, 40s, 50s. And when you think back to your own experience, anyone my age and older, of being in middle school or high school, imagine you're in the bathroom of whatever whatever sex bathroom you're in, um, or the locker room, and someone in the opposite sex tries to come in. What type of reaction? Would we have anticipated then? Yeah. I think, you know, in my generation, uh, I think a lot of girls' mothers and fathers would have taught them, I mean, depending on the culture of the family, but would have taught them uh, stand up to a boy who tries to invade your space, you know? And and there there's more of like a girl power spirit that, you know, Hopefully, there would be several girls in the bathroom, not just one, if a boy tried to come in. And if a boy tried to come in, you would hope, I think most parents would have hoped for their daughters, um, that that you would, that the girl would react like, what the hell are you doing here? Get the hell out of here. You know, we, we need that aggressive defense of our boundaries in certain situations. And I, I, I feel Stephanie, like it are, was... are you talking about, sorry to interrupt, are you talking about if a, um, a a transgender girl came in, meaning a biological boy who identifies as girl and tries to and lives socially as a girl, or are you talking about just any boy? Well, so there was no such thing in the common, you know, there was no such thing as a trans student when I was in middle school and high school. We had gender atypical people and mm -hmm. I was friends with them. I was one of them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I I was a punk kid and I hung out with the gay goths, you know, <laughs> but um, but there was no such thing as trans at the time. And so I'm saying, again, coming from that place of thinking from a blank slate, thinking from a naive background, imagining what was it like back when we were in school, right? And so just follow follow me here because I'm going somewhere with this. Um you would you would hope the reaction if anybody was trying to invade your daughter's space would be get the hell out of here, right? And um, similarly, in a male space, I mean, obviously females do not pose the same threat to males that males pose to females. But at the same time, you want the boys' bathroom and the boys' locker room to be a place where your son, you know, whatever his personality, whatever his interests, whatever his sexual orientation, you want that to be a place 
where your son can, you know, momentarily be exposed without fearing the the gaze of the opposite sex, right? And these right. are just things we counted on until very recently. And so I'm just thinking in terms of how the narrative was flipped, right? That that if if someone respond, if someone were to respond in the way that when I was growing up, we would consider normal and healthy, which is get the hell out of here. You don't belong in here. That that became reframed as bullying. Right. Right. Because the boy says he's a girl. The girl says she's a boy. And maybe that comes with a, an appearance that mimics the appearance that is typically of the opposite sex. Maybe it doesn't. I mean, in this day and age... There are a lot of people who believe the idea that you are whatever you say you are and you don't have to do anything to prove it. You don't have to try to mimic the appearance of the opposite sex or you can have a beard and long hair or, you know, any combination, anything goes. So in these cases, I don't know in the bullying cases that were brought to anybody's attention. I don't know exactly how much someone really tried to look like the opposite sex. I don't know how much that matters either. You know, again, coming from that naive perspective, if a boy came into the bathroom looking like a boy versus if the boy came into the bathroom with long hair and a skirt and painted nails, you know, I, either way, I think that we took for granted until very recently that an aggressive defensive no was actually the appropriate response. And so it's just interesting that it got flipped to be that those defending their own spaces were considered the bullies. And that to me sounds like an example of, you may be familiar with the acronym DARVO, um, deny. No. Oh, oh, this is a good one. So it's deny, attack, reverse <coughs> victim and offender. Oh, okay. So I'll say that one more time. First, you deny what you're being accused of. Then you counterattack in a way that reverses who's the victim and who's the offender. Right. So again, up until recently, if a male tries to enter a female space, it's understood that he's the offender and the females are the victim who have a right to defend themselves. Right. But if we flip the narrative and do Darvo, it's deny that he's a man, deny that he's actually the intruder, um, attack the females for having their boundaries, and reverse who's the victim and who's the perpetrator here. Right. So it seems like a classic example of Darvo. Yeah, I mean, you raise some good points. Um, certainly social uh, mores and expectations have changed tremendously since the days that you and I were in high school. It sounds like you and I are roughly the same age. Um, and, you know, students are, young people are malleable. Um, they're the first ones, sometimes not just to... Um, conform to the new social rules, but to push them. Um, and I think that that's definitely what we're seeing in the case of, of the trans issue. It's a very much a, a, an issue that young people care passionately about and try to promote. Um, but let me kind of address what you're saying about, um, about the whole bathroom question or sex specific spaces question. Um, and uh, you know, at the risk of being too legalistic and institutionally minded, let me address it through the lens of how these cases have played out um, where it matters in the United States, which is in the courts. Um, starting with what you, a point that you made, which is a very good one, which is that you know, not all, uh, let's say, male identified um, students today, um, you know, try, well, let's, stay, let's stay, stick with female because that's important for your um, um, story's purpose, right? Not all students who identify as female as we're told, have to actually try to look like they're female, right? They, they could look like me and just say, yeah, I'm, I'm a girl. Just let me in. I'm just like one of you. Um, but it goes without saying that, you know, if you are, let's say, an ACLU lawyer and you want to try to get a valuable precedent in court that's going to change the behavior, not just of the school where your client is, right? Because your first duty is to your client. But more importantly, you're looking for a precedent that's going to change policy at the very least inside your state or federal circuit, but hopefully also throughout the entire United States. You're going to look for the perfect case, the perfect vehicle, right? The, the plaintiff who is the perfect vehicle for, for policy change through litigation. 
And that often means, and as you know, somebody who studies um, uh, uh, judicial policymaking, that often means that judges see the most unrepresentative of cases when making policy on complicated social problems. And I think actually the, the, the trans issue, the trans student issue, um, highlights this um, maybe better than almost any other example that I've come across. So we know that, um, that when most people think about the propriety of students using bathrooms designated for the opposite sex, the obvious concern is with males who identify as female and go into female spaces. It's going to be no surprise to you to learn, Stephanie, that the vast majority of these lawsuits are exactly the opposite. It's females who identify as male and want to go into boys' bathrooms. And that already allows um, for uh, the ACLU, the Transgender Law Center, whatever organization is um, litigating on behalf of a plaintiff, um, to suppress a lot of the public concerns about what's going on. But of course, if you get the precedent where a judge says, yes, you cannot deny a student access based on the fact that they are uh, transgender, um, you can just then turn around and apply it to cases where boys go into girls' bathrooms. You don't have to have a separate case that you litigate specifically for that type of, of, um, of access, right? And that's the point. Um, further, these plaintiffs um, unanimously, by the way, in every single court case, these plaintiffs are always very conforming to binary, rigid binary um, gender expression and behavior. So they are females who do everything in their power to look like typical, meaning stereotypical boys, um, look and behave like, like typical boys. Um, and, you know, that on the one hand, that creates an internal tension for the argument that plaintiffs make, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but on the other hand, it at least allows plaintiffs and, uh, and the organizations representing them to say to the judge, look, um, this student looks more like the boys than, than he, she does like the girls. Um, not just looks in terms of their kind of outward gender presentation, the fact that they have short hair and, you know, whatever stereotypical male dress, uh, um, clothing that they wear, but also they've already started, usually they've already started puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, so they've already masculinized themselves um, in ways that make them um, different from, uh, uh, physically different from, from the other girls and maybe a little bit more similar to the boys. Um, so these are carefully chosen cases, carefully chosen plaintiffs, right? It's not just anybody who says, I want to sue my school. Uh, if you're the ACLU, you're going to be very careful in trying to find the perfect plaintiff as the vehicle to get wide social policy change. Um, so then this raises the question of privacy, right? Um, and I should point out, before we get to the privacy question, this is exactly where the whole question of context and discretion comes in. Because if you remember what I said earlier, that the whole premise of civil rights is that we cannot trust the discretion of local institutions especially when it comes to these complicated interactions that require um, uh, taking context into account. Um, because, you know, if you take a step back, you, you, you're likely to say, which is something that I do say, every single case is different. Every school district is different. You know, there's, there's a difference between a school district where half the population are, you know, devout um, Muslims from, um, from Somalia and a, uh, and a school district in, in Berkeley, California, where they're all extremely progressive, upper middle class white kids. Um, there's a difference between you know, a small dist district and a big district, between a district that has an, out, you know, a, um, an old building with very few bathrooms, with, uh, with not great uh, privacy barriers, and a brand new building where students have a lot more privacy when they go into the bathroom. Um, there's, there's a difference between a, a, you know, a, a school that has had multiple cases of boys pretending to be girls in order to take advantage of girls, whether by looking at them in bathrooms or competing on teams or anything like that, although the competing on teams things, I don't think boys do that um, just to gain advantage. But regardless, um, it, you need to take context into account, and that means uh, deferring to the discretion of school administrators. But that's exactly what this kind of civil rights regulation is trying to prevent, discretion. 
Um, and so that brings up the question of privacy, right? Because if you can't rely on discretion, if you can't say, all right, we're going to solve each case on a case by case, case basis and ask whether this particular student entering this particular facility um, is going to cause so much embarrassment um, on behalf of other students that it's not advisable to let him or her do so. Um, you need kind of these hard and fast rules. So how, how did courts end up looking at the privacy issue? Um, first of all, it's important to understand that the kind of legal action that plaintiffs were demanding here is known as a preliminary injunction. A preliminary injunction is um, it's not a full trial on the merits of a legal claim. Instead, it basically involves a plaintiff saying, look, there's some, uh, you know, I'm expected to suffer this, um, this injury in the short term, and I need you, a court, to act quickly to prevent it from happening while we are going to do the, the full trial, right? So pending a full trial on the merits. And so uh, because of the emergency nature of a pre preliminary injunction um, hearing, the standards of, of evidence, the standards of argumentation are different. Uh, you'll see why that's really important in just a second. So for example, um, plaintiffs don't have to prove their legal argument on its merits. They just have to have to show that it's plausible. Um, or the, the way in which this is said in, in the law is that it's likely to succeed on the merits. Likely. So the threshold is much lower for a pre preliminary injunction hearing. Why is that important? Because when the, the official argument that plaintiffs were making in these cases is that schools, by denying them access to their desired bathrooms, were um, uh, discriminating against them on the basis of stereotypes. Now, that's obviously a problem because um, these kids were conforming to stereotypes, just stereotypes of the opposite sex. So to, to frame this as students just want to be non-conforming to stereotypes and schools are preventing them from doing so is obviously absurd. It's wrong. It's just factually inaccurate. But because the, the courts, the, the judges, didn't have to examine that argument in depth, because all they had to do was say, okay, it's good enough. It's close enough to what courts have said in the past. Now we can move on to the other section of uh, these lawsuits, which is a balancing of equities, or in simple terms, a balancing of harms. Who's going to be harmed more? The school and the students on whose, half, on whose behalf it claims to speak, or the student who's suing the school if um, not allowed to use his or her de desired restrooms and sports teams. Um, and so once the question of balancing of harms comes into play, that changes the entire calculus of the lawsuit. Because number one, now you have all these major medical organizations filing amicus briefs on behalf of the students, basically saying to the court, if you don't allow these kids to access the, the bathrooms that they want, um, they're going to suffer irreversible and profound emotional and psychological harm. Um, and that's, you know, that's very, very persuasive for a judge, right? To have all medical organizations lining up behind the plaintiff and, and saying, like, this is going to cause this particular individual a tremendous amount of irreversible harm. Um, so that's number one. Number two, you know, the school you have in these lawsuits, the school is representing um, students who feel or would feel uncomfortable at having to share a bathroom with a member of the opposite sex. But these students for the judge are abstractions, right? The, the, the judge is not, is not looking into the eyes of these students. It's, it's, it's much more abstract than that. Whereas the, the judge is looking into the eyes of the transgender plaintiff. So there's already a, a profound um, imbalance of, of empathy here um, that works to the benefit of the plaintiff. But then finally, um, schools actually have to prove, or at least prove with a high degree of plausibility, that students um, uh, will face these privacy deprivations in a way that's going to be very harmful to them. Um, and this is where the importance of adjudication comes in, the fact that it's a lawsuit and not, let's say, a regulation issued by the uh, Office, Office for Civil Rights. Because the only type of evidence that judges can consider is evidence that goes through the, the rules of evidence under civil law. Um, and that means that, for example, you can't rely on hearsay, right? Um, evidence has to be entered into the record according to very strict rules. 
Now, these schools were arguing about what is likely to happen if they change their internal policies for which bathrooms um, students can and cannot use. So by definition, they were arguing forward-looking hypothetical scenarios that were nevertheless very plausible. But those kinds of hypothetical scenarios are exactly what judges, in contrast to other types of policymakers, are not allowed to take into account, or at least are, are kind of professionally um, uh, discouraged from taking into account. And so you have, for example, in the, in the, in the Seventh Circuit case, Whitaker versus Kenosha School District, <clears throat> um, the federal court in that case said that the school district's arguments about privacy were based, and I'm quoting here, were sheer conjecture and abstraction, right? So any concern whatsoever about privacy violations from allowing members of the opposite sex into the other bathroom must be based on sheer conjecture and abstraction, which is absurd, right? Because of course there are going to be cases of severe discomfort. Now you can argue that a person shouldn't feel discomfort at um, having to share a certain space with the opposite sex, but you can't argue that they're not gonna feel discomfort. Of course they are, we know that. And the reason we know that is because these schools took action after school board members and parents started speaking up on behalf of their own kids. So, <clears throat> So the federal courts proved to be a venue that was extremely advantageous to plaintiffs and extremely disadvantageous to schools um, in ways that, you know, kind of offend our, our common sense of how these issues should be dealt with. Wow. <laughs> you laid that out so clearly. It, you know, it makes me wonder where... Where are the parents of the trans identifying kids in this? And and what are their thoughts like? I mean, there's been a lot of speculation in our gender critical community about the sort of narcissistic parent, the the Munchausen by proxy that, you know, the parent getting special attention and feeling good about themselves by way of having this very special magical thing called the trans child that now their their duty is to look after and, and aren't they just such a wonderful parent of such a special kid, right? Like yeah. we've wondered about that. And I think about, you know, there's obviously a balancing of needs here. Even if you hold the belief, as many people do, but you and I do not, that there is such a thing as a quote unquote trans child, that this is innate, right? That there really is a male brain and a female body yada yada, right? Even if you hold that belief, it's still a classic trolley problem, right? So for those who aren't familiar with the trolley problem, it's basically like you're in charge of a, a train heading down the tracks and there are five people tied to the tracks in front of you. And if you flip a switch, you can make that, you can derail that train onto another track where it will only run over one person. What do you do? And this is uh, an ex it's it's an ethical dilemma for many people because of course if you're just thinking numbers it's better to kill one person than five but if you're the one who flips the switch then you feel that that moral burden of I just killed that one person um, plus there's of course other considerations that you could bring into a trolley problem but this is kind of a classic trolley problem even if you hold the belief that there really is such a thing as a trans kid. And that it would really be best for that person, not just at this point in time, but best in the in the whole span of their lifetime for the world around them to so so called affirm, right? You still have other players here, and um, and of course it's hypothetical, but absolutely real that a large number of kids will feel uncomfortable in that situation, unless. You do this massive gaslighting and brainwashing campaign that has been going on for the last several years of convincing kids to deny their own sense perception. Um, but it makes me wonder, where are the parents in helping these trans identifying kids understand and conform to the limits of reality and the needs of other people? Because I'm just putting myself in the in that in the mindset of a parent, let's say a parent who doesn't have a personality disorder, a parent who's got classic liberal values and who's looking out for their kid but really believes that their kid is trans and that supporting and affirming the trans identity is the best thing to do, I would still feel like 
I'm in a position of responsibility to help my precious little trans identifying kid understand how other people feel, right? And and I feel like it would be a huge disservice to that kid to take all of the discomfort that the opposite sex feels about them being in their space and chalk it up to bigotry or bullying or harassment. You know, I'm not helping my kid understand how the world works, how under, understand people, understand and respect boundaries, navigate consent, um, cultivate a character structure that can move through the world um, cooperating with other people. I'm not doing any of that, right? I'm just kind of colluding with this victim narrative and this idea that I have this really special child that requires all this special treatment, no matter how it makes other people feel. And if you're teaching a kid that other people's boundaries, um, if they, if other people don't want to give you what you want, that means there's something wrong with them. That is such a dangerous lesson to instill in a child. That is how you breed a personality disorder. Someone who persistently, you know, someone who has an excessive sense of entitlement, little regard for others' boundaries, and will stop at nothing to get what they want. Yeah, I mean that that's that's well put. Um, let me address that, but segue from what. Uh, from our, our previous um, discussion to this issue that you're raising, which I think is super important. Um, one way to think about this, Stephanie, is that in the United States and in other countries too, but I think especially in the United States, um, this entire issue has been framed in the language of rights. And you know, uh, there's a great book by Mary Ann Glendon of Harvard Law School called Rights Talk. Um, that I recommend to your listeners. And it's a, it's a really good meditation on how, I mean, as she puts it, how rights talk has impoverished our political discourse, that we can no longer talk about these complicated trade-offs of civic responsibility, um, of reciprocity, um, what you call boundaries, um, you know, uh, limitations to one's desires and needs and things like that. Um, that once we get into this rights talk, where it's just my right and against your rights, um, this this sort of thinking lends itself very very easily to uh, kind of an absolutizing, you know, radical individualized understanding of the relationship of the individual to society, uh, and that's very unhealthy. Um, and it's certainly not just in this area, right? Um, rights talk has taken over pretty much every area of American life. You can see, for example, the abortion issue. Um, you know, the American discussion of abortion to an outsider, and I, I'm an outsider. Um, I, you know, I did not go to high school and college uh, in this country. Um, and if you come to the United States from another country or another, um, another culture, and you kind of see from the outside how Americans talk about abortion, it's quite shocking. Um, because each side is, you know, kind of asserting a rights claim, the right to life, the right to choose versus the right to life, right? Um, that are totally, they speak, they, they talk past each other. Um, obviously, everybody, uh, let me, 99% you know, of people in the pro-choice kind of right to bodily autonomy camp agree, obviously, that if this little creature is a person, therefore deserving of all the moral weight of our consideration and deserving of, of a protection called a right to life, it shouldn't be aborted under any circumstance. Likewise, 99% um, of people in the pro-life camp agree that people should have choice and bodily autonomy and all these kinds of things. They just think that there should be some limits to that, right? So it's not just a question of rights. It's a question of um, is it comes down to the question: What is this thing inside your your uterus? Is it a person? And if so, at what stage does it acquire uh, the status of, of moral personhood? And, and what does that mean in terms of our moral obligations and duties towards that that being? That's the correct kind of philosophically correct way to reason your way through the abortion debate. But in the United States, it's just right to life, right to choice, right to life, right to choice, as if that gets us anywhere. By the way, um, I just have to take this opportunity to yeah, put in a plug for my episode on this issue because this is exactly what I talked about oh, good. with okay. uh, Robin Atkins, LMHC. I can't remember off the top of my head what episode number it is, uh, but it's called Two Therapists Debate Abortion because oh, I'm pro-choice, she's pro-life, and we're not at each other's throats. We talk respectfully and we explore these issues. So I just have to put in a plug for any listeners who are interested in this topic to check that out. 
Well, I'm glad you did that because I'm going to listen to it now. N- not right now during our interview, but but um, <laughs> right after. Um, Great. So, so thanks. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so that's kind of a segue to, to your very good question about parents. Um, because, you know, a parent, obviously a parent who kind of raises their child on this impoverished understanding of everything is a right. Um, you can see how that type of parenting lends itself to um, really a miseducation of the young. Um, a failure to impart to them the idea that living in a democracy, living in a, 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 um, a, a, true, a truly diverse society means navigating complicated issues, um, restraining one's own appetites and desires, um, acting with a sense of reciprocity, um, you know, setting aside, even when one thinks that one, thinks that one is in the right, setting it, setting it aside, uh, um, not just for pragmatic purposes, but also just for, um, for, for, for other purposes of, of just recognizing that you know, uh, you're, not, you're not the center of the universe. Um, Look, I mean, when it comes to parents of so-called trans kids, um, I, you know, I, especially from the um, from from the side of this debate that wants to limit or do away with gender affirming interventions and thinks that this whole trans stuff is is obscene, um, I think there's too much of a willingness to demonize parents, and I'm not saying that you are, um, but I think that I, I see it a lot demonizing parents and even parents of so-called trans kids. Um, and I think we have to start from understanding that they have been brainwashed by this, at least as much as their kids. They have been told by everybody in their life system, including their doctors, including the people who they trust the most with their child's mental and physical well-being, that there really is only one way to keep your child happy and even alive, and that is to affirm, affirm, affirm. And if that's the way you've, con- you've been conditioned to think about it, and then if you add to that this whole element of rights talk that we've been talking about and the, uh, the, the, you know, the analogy that activists have made between black civil rights and trans rights, um, it's understandable why parents begin to see the world as you know, their righteous son or daughter against a vicious, cruel, bigoted world whose every demand or desire is intrinsically inappropriate. So it makes sense to me why parents, even these glitter moms, right, for whom uh, there's no, there's just no reasoning with them. Um, it makes sense to me why they come to think about their kids and their kids' interactions with their surroundings in these terms. But I still think that they've been brainwashed. I, th- I still think that to some extent they're the victims of circumstance here. Um, but yes, I th- you're 100% right. The, the, the obligation of parents, even parents of so-called trans kids, is of course to encourage this se- sense of civic reciprocity, of, of boundaries. And, and look, I, I, think, I don't think that parents of trans kids are not doing that. I think they are doing that, for the most part. Maybe some are not, but I think for the most part, they're probably doing that, if only because they have to. They know that their kids are not going to be just kind of blindly accepted and affirmed by everyone everywhere. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I, I would hesitate to say that, um, that that's typical of the parenting mindset, but we do see examples of it for sure. Um, and maybe the last thing that I'll say on this is, it seems to me that, I say this as a parent, glitter moms are the last person on planet earth that you are going to persuade, um, of, you know, kind of the, the, um, the inappropriateness of, of medically transitioning kids. They've, they're already invested in it. For a parent of a child to, who has already gone through these procedures, the effects of which are contrary to what we are told, um, very often irreversible um, and very damaging um, health-wise, for a parent to say to themselves, what have I done? This was a mistake takes superhuman integrity. I'm not even sure I, I, I say that even the way I said that was arrogant. I, I wouldn't be able to do it, honestly. If I was so invested um, in my kid's identity, if I, if I knew that I did this to my kid, um, every fiber of my being would, uh, w- would protect me from having to come to terms with what I've done. And so I, I totally understand. And that, by the way, that's another reason why we have to kind of abandon this, this discourse of blaming parents for transing their kids. Because they're not, they're doing it out of the best of intentions for the most part, or at least in most cases. They're doing it out of the best of intentions. And we have to find a way to talk to them and bring them back 
to sanity, to team reality. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's what I'll say on that. As a therapist, I've gotten an up close and personal view at what people tend to struggle with day in and day out. Turns out it's almost universal that we know we should be taking better care of ourselves in terms of the basic building blocks of well-being like diet and exercise. But as valuable as it is for our mental and physical health to change our lifestyle habits, it's also much easier said than done. People often set goals that are too lofty, only to feel even worse about themselves when their aspirations inevitably fail. That's why I recommend starting with positive changes that are as simple as possible. Enter my new favorite beverage line. Organifi makes it so easy to improve your nutrition and start feeling better right now with refreshing plant-based blends of superfoods and adaptogens that you can just mix with water. My personal favorite is their green juice. It contains moringa, ashwagandha, chlorella, spirulina, wheatgrass, beets, turmeric, mint, lemon, and coconut water. 100% organic with no added sugar. And it tastes great. My family loves Organifi Gold, which promotes relaxation and restful sleep, served mixed with warm almond milk before bed. Organifi also makes several other powerful blends, all organic and loaded with vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytonutrients, anti-inflammatory herbs, and adaptogens. For less than $3 and 3 grams of sugar per serving, you can start giving your cells the support they need to manage stress and feel good. Check out their product line at Organifi.com. That's spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com. And use promo code SOMETHERAPIST to get 20% off your entire order. Your whole body will thank you. I think you're bringing up such important points. And I agree for the most part. I think because my personal view is that we all contain a mixture of you know, good and bad, and that most of us have a fundamentally good nature. Most of us are not corrupt at the deepest level of our hearts, right? But there are, there's a small minority of people who are sociopathic and irredeemable. Um, And there's also a small number of people who maybe aren't sociopathic, but who have deeply entrenched personality disorders um, that make them very hard to reach. Um, I think most of us are navigating good and evil. But that said, you know, the 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 seven deadly sins will get you, right? And and there's there is this kind of I think we're we're all susceptible to the shadow taking over. And so an example of what I mean is that people who people who have the hubris to think that they could never be fooled are the ones who are more, most at risk of being fooled. You yeah. know, if you know that you're capable of being fooled, then you can protect yourself because you can be a little bit skeptical of your own thought process at times in a way that keeps it clean, uh, that allows you to self-examine, right, and see if there's any kind of idea pathogens infecting you and if that's really yeah. your own thought and where you got it from and whose intention was that, you know? And so – you know, I think our our hubris right now, uh, including in all of us, right? Not just not just in a handful of really corrupt people, but it's 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 our hubris that I, I see really getting to us in a, a number of ways. Um, and so I think the that even in the the parent that's that's not fitting the description of the you know, the kind of extreme Munchausen by proxy situation that's, that does exist, right? Because there are parents who oh, yeah. are deeply narcissistic, yeah, who are sure. abusing their children with this stuff. But, you know, a- aside from from those folks, you know, do we have these little seeds of evil within us, you know, this desire to be special, to have something grandiose and magical and meaningful about your life? Again, there's there's a valid impulse in there, right? A longing for... You could say it's a longing for the divine, right? The 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 grandiosity that we all possess in various degrees, I think, is is part of our longing for peak experiences, communion with the divine, um, a deep sense of meaning and purpose. We all have that. It's right to want uh, those those things because they're such a part of what it is to be human and live a meaningful and fulfilling life. But that doesn't mean that we're not misguided in the ways that we pursue that sometimes. And there's something so. There's, there's this grandiose, magical hero's journey to the story of 
being the parent of the trans child. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I say this with compassion, not with blame. I agree that they've been brainwashed and that most parents deeply love their kids. In fact, <laughs> that's a, a lot of my arguments rest on that. Right, because I think there's this myth of the bigoted parent, the myth of the parent that doesn't accept their trans kid, and that they're just so full of hate. And I actually don't. Be- my my ver- my vision of human nature doesn't really accommodate this idea that there are all these terrible parents out there. And I think part of how we ended up here is that. There are people who did have pretty bad parenting who haven't resolved that yet, and they're projecting mm. it onto the world. So the the savior complexes we see, for instance, on the 20-something teachers you'll see on libs of TikTok, you know, that kind of yeah. grandiose savior complex of I'm protecting children from their horrible, evil, bigoted parents. It's like that to me just tells me that you have some issues with your parents that you haven't done enough therapy around yet, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. That's what I see. Because I do think most parents are good and most parents are flawed. And we all have these seeds of the, you know, the kind of sins within our hearts. And I, I speak this from a broad perspective, not from a particular religion, but just mm. from my own kind of innate spirituality, that there are these these shadows that can get us, right? If we're not regularly kind of self-examining and tuning into whatever our higher power might be. Um, so that's just kind of my personal take on all of that. I hope you've been enjoying this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast. If you like what you're hearing, now's a great time to like, subscribe, follow, rate, review, or share. You can also support the podcast by visiting sometherapist.com slash shop, where you will find goods and services I have personally curated to support your well-being and enrich your life. We're just building the shop, so check back periodically and feel free to suggest recommendations. All right, now back to the show. I think I'll pick up with some questions from Twitter or at least to just review what people are saying on Twitter. So um, before interviewing you, I posted on Twitter that I would be and asked if anyone had any questions for you. And I just want to review some of the things that have been said. People have already answered each other's questions. Um, But I want to give a a shout out to some of these accounts, actually. So Courage is a Habit asked, what is a good resource that is easy for parents to understand the damaging side effects of hormone blockers? And then uh, Susie Maccabee tagged Christina Buttons. And Christina Buttons said that the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine has a page dedicated to the studies that outline the risks of gender-related treatments. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all those people, by the way. These are these are great yeah. accounts to follow. So Courage is a Habit, if you're on Twitter, is at Courage Habit. Their website is courageisahabit.org. They provide great resources for parents who are trying to get informed and empowered to address how these issues are unfolding in the schools. Christina Buttons is another amazing person to follow. She is, for those who don't know, um, the girlfriend of Colin Wright from episode four. And Colin is also the founder of Reality's Last Stand, where Leora has done several publications. So Christina does amazing research on this issue on Twitter. She is at Buttons Lives, um, and she's currently writing for The Daily Wire. All right. And then uh, Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, SEGM.org. Um, and you can su- follow them at, actually, I don't remember off the top of my head, Um, (laughs) but, uh, you can find them on Twitter as well. Um, so I just wanted to shout out, uh, if anyone is listening, interested in these issues on Twitter and not following these accounts, please do. But all that being said, Leo, do you have anything to add to Courage as a Habit's original question about resources for parents to understand the damaging effects of hormone blockers? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, let me just, uh, underscore that SEGM is by far and away the most serious organization dealing with this issue in the United States. And probably I would venture to say the world today. Um, By this issue, I mean kind of the medical research, the clinical realities behind um, pediatric gender interventions. Um, So I strongly recommend your listeners to to follow them. On Twitter, it's um, at SEGM, so S-E-G-M. Um, uh, underscore, underscore EBM. What is that? EBM. I yeah. just looked it up. Yeah. yeah. At S E G M underscore EBM. I don't know what the EBM is. <laughs> evidence based medicine. Oh, evidence based medicine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thanks. So, um, 
So yeah, so Segem is, is by far and away the most important resource that you can access here. Um, and very impartial, by the way. Um, I find myself being fact-checked by Segem sometimes, and, and which is great um, because you know when you're dealing with such a complicated issue, there's simply no way that you can get 100 things 100% of the things right 100% of the time. Um, so second is definitely the, the first place you should go and it's often going to be the last place you'll need to go. Um, look, I mean, the bottom line is these interventions are experimental. Um, that is one of the reasons why European countries have pulled back from them. Um, it's essentially an uncontrolled experiment being run on, on minors. And, um, and that means that, you know, just as we don't really have good data about the benefits, the supposed benefits of um, hormones and surgeries for mental health, we also don't have very good re and reliable long-term data on the risks. What we do know is, number one, that interfering with puberty is almost certainly going to have serious consequences because puberty is um, the most dramatic event that the human body will go through throughout its entire existence. Um, we know, for example, that the hormonal processes involved in puberty directly affect brain development, bone development, um, and that if you stop those processes in their tracks, that's very likely to, ha uh, to have um, irreversible effects on brain and bone development. Um, we know, based on studies done on uh, pre precocious puberty, that um, puberty blockers have certain risks connected to osteoporosis and things like that. Although, again, we don't have, you know anywhere near the, the kind of high quality data that we would from a, a drug that, that goes through randomized controlled trials on a huge number of people over a very long period of time. But we do have some indications that these interventions are very risky. Um, and then of course, if you do puberty blockers followed up by cross-ex hormones, you're infertile. Um, that's not a question of whether uh, it's gonna happen. It's, it's a certainty um, because the, the, the organs that produce the, the sex gametes are not allowed to develop. So, um, and, you know, sterility and lifelong infertility is, of course, a health risk and a mental health risk because people want to have kids. It's part, uh, later in life, it's, it's, it's part of a fully lived human life. Um, some people don't want to have kids, and that's fine. Um, they can live a meaningful life without kids. But for most people, that's not an option. For most people, having kids is what makes life worth living. And to deprive someone of that because as a 12-year-old girl, they said, I don't want to go through puberty as a girl, um, and with no evidence that, um, that the, the interventions are going to cause improvement in their mental health over a long period of time, strikes me as just um, as cruel experimentation, not just experimentation. And let me add to that, that among all the things we don't have evidence for, I don't know that we have any evidence to support the claim if you were to survey a random sample of 1,000 12-year-olds and ask them, do you want to have children as an adult, and follow up 10, 20, 30 years later, I don't think we have I, – I don't think there's been a survey done like that. I haven't looked for it, but but I, I don't believe that the results would show that that it's predictive, that, that what you say you want at 12 is predictive, you know, because I, I know anecdotally – plenty of people who thought they didn't want children when they were younger and then decided they wanted children when they were older. On my detransition uh, interview with Oliver Davies, uh, that, that one is called Oliver Davies, Healing Through Detransition, he shares about that too. How And yeah. he was an adult. You know, he was 26 when he decided that he didn't want children enough to ruin his fertility. And now he's in his 30s and he's changed his mind because he's his heart has healed. He's met someone he really loves, right? So I don't think we have any evidence to support the claim that um, kids at, at any age can predict whether they will want to have children in the future. Yeah. And, and I would say, I mean, even just to propose a study like that strikes me as um, bizarre. <laughs> I, th I, mean, I think we need to, <laughs> I mean, I think we actually need that study because all of this non-evidence-based practice has many assumptions that are untested. And one of those assumptions is that whatever, you know, regardless of the gender issue, that that a 12-year-old can tell you honestly and accurately whether or not they're going to want to have kids when they're 20, 30, 40. So let me slightly disagree with you here, Stephanie. Okay, great. Um, I sometimes get pushback from people on my side of this debate 
telling me things like, you know, to the extent that you get into the weeds in these debates with people like Jack Turbin um, over what the studies do and do not show, the, the very fact that you are getting into these debates is already conceding too much to the other side, right? People mm-hmm. who say no Fair. kid is born in the wrong body, just we should never do these things, um, you know, hard, hard no. Um, and there's no amount of research or studies that would persuade me otherwise. I, I understand the position. Um, but, you know, if you agree that uh, gender dysphoria is a real human experience, that some adults have it, um, that it's possible that some kids could have it, in other words, that, that it could appear early in life, and that it's an agonizing experience, not just in adolescence, but, but throughout the rest of your life, and that certain forms of physical intervention, um, hormone surgeries, things like that, can alleviate that suffering and make your life more livable, um, you know... I, I, I I allow for that possibility. I have no basis on which to reject it. So for me, the the, the getting into the weeds of the scientific research, research is important. Um, it's also important because it just so happens to be the case that our medical institutions have been captured on this issue and believe that there really is scientific evidence uh, for these interventions where we know that there isn't, but, but they believe there is. Um, so... That's the kind of pushback that I sometimes get from people in our side. And, you know, so I want to do a little bit of that pushback now um, against what you said, because I think that actually on this question, even conceding that this is a a legitimate research question seems to me to concede too much. Um, I just don't see what you're going to find of value by asking 12-year-old girls or 13-year-old girls if they want to have kids later in life. I mean, even if it turns out that a, a, a non uh, that it in, a substantial minority or or even a majority of them do say that they want to have kids later in life. What is that going to tell us? That's still not going to tell us that uh, that that's not that's not going to prove that there aren't gender dysphoric kids. Um, you know, at most, it's going to say, "Oh yeah, we just got to be careful um, uh, to whom we give puberty blockers and hormones." But you know, I imagine, and I think you do too, that probably a majority of those kids are going to say. Ugh. Um, who wants kids, you know? Um, so, you know, you said that you know people who changed their mind from, t- from their 20s. You know, I know a person who's changed their mind about having kids from when they were 32 and then compared to 33. Like, these decisions can change in a heartbeat. Um, and it is a little surprising to me that those who are kind of on the side of strong bodily autonomy, pro-choice, you know, on the abortion issue... Um, can even fathom being on the side of gender affirming care here um, because it, it, it deprives a woman of even the possibility of ever changing her mind. Um, and the same thing, of course, with men. Um, but, you know, we know that teenage girls are going through this at much higher rates than, than men are. So um, I'm not saying that, you know, that that should determine how you vote tomorrow. I'm just saying that it's... Um, uh, you know, there's a kind of the strong, there's a strong link here between the abortion question and the gender affirming care question, and that if you really do care about reproductive rights, autonomy, all these, all these watchwords, um, you should you should be at the very least very suspicious of these of these hormonal interventions for teenagers. Fair enough. I think that's a valid pushback, and it raises a broader question that we should bring to so many conversations that we have, which is you know, when is willingness to engage in debate a concession, right? Mm. When, when are you basically arguing with a narcissist, uh, <laughs> but the narcissist being the ideology itself, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and my perspective here is just like, show me the evidence, because I know there is none. <laughs> show me the evidence yeah. that, uh, and well, because the, the logic seems to be that what a kid knows about their so-called identity in childhood is always going to be true and that what they know about their future desire for children, if you know, that if a 12 year old says they don't want kids, that that means they'll never want kids. I mean, yeah. that's, it's just false. We, the evidence right. doesn't exist. Right. So I'm just like, show right. me the evidence. Cause I know there is none. Um, but then there's also this kind of logic in there too, this unspoken assumption that, um, that there's something just so uniquely special about these yeah trans kids, you know, that they defy the laws of physics, that even if all these gender typical girls 
can't accurately predict whether they're going to want to reproduce and boys too, because male fertility is also affected, you know, that even if all the other kids don't have the developmental capacity to predict what they're going to want 20 years later, that, um, that these magical special trans kids do know. Right. Right. And, and that's where just, there's nothing from developmental psychology that, that backs up these claims of how special these kids are. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And it's, uh, it, it, it fits into the kind of the broader, criticism of gender ideology as being kind of a pseudo-religion, right? I, I tend, I, I, I try not to use that term um, because I actually think, and you know, I'm not especially religious, but um, I think it's derogatory towards religion. Religion is a, is a serious, you know, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, these are serious b- bodies of thought and practice. Um, they, they tap into ideas of transcendental uh, meaning um, transcendental authority. Um, it's not just some spurious, you know, whatever feels right is right um, type of dynamic, which is very much at play, I think, in the in the in the trans movement. If it feels true, it is true. Um, so I, I hesitate to give that analogy, but 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 I think it is in some cases apt, and this is one of them. And I think that there is an incl- a, a tendency. Um, among, well, I'll just say on the left, because it is on the left, to think of these kids as, as possessing some kind of um, mysterious, you know, magical quality. Um, you can see this, for example, in the writings of Diane Ehrensaft, who is, um, she may not be the most influential figure in, um, in uh, hormonal interventions and surgical interventions for kids on these issues, um, although she has had quite a bit of uh, influence shaping the public uh, narrative about it. But she is, I, I, in some ways, she represents kind of the, the most, um, how should I put this diplomatically, um, the most curious of the ideologues. Um, just the, the, the way she thinks about childhood development and gender is um, uh, it's just very, very bizarre. So she'll s- say things like, um, Children as young as two know who they are, and they are our teachers. So gender is this quality that manifests through the bodies of these very young kids who are very atypical, um, who then become a kind of vanguard in a revolution. And she says they are the, revolu- they are the revolutionaries, right? She, she kind of endows them with this historic mission. It's, it's very kind of... Um, um, it's, it's like a Marxism and mysticism bound up together, right? They are this um, vanguard that's going to lead humanity towards a higher plane of existence. If we would but just follow them blindly, um, defer to what they say. I'm going to put them in a yeah. plug for another episode now. It's an yeah. episode that, as of our recording date, has not come out yet, but may come out before or after this episode because I release things in kind of a random order. Um, But my conversation with Matt Osborne, uh, we talk about this a lot because he, I believe his story is that he was raised being told that he was an indigo child. And so this myth of the magical child um, is something he's deeply familiar with and and investigated. I just wanted to put in a plug for that. But yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is that there's kind of this this quasi-religious and and that's why I would call it more like a cult, because I think if if you look at what differentiates a religion from a cult, um, a religion is something that can ultimately have a healthy and sustainable place in someone's life. It can, you know, give them meaning, purpose, guidance, uh, you know, a way to understand good and evil, a way to navigate challenges. Of course, no religion is perfect. My belief is that religions are only as good as the people running them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not Christian. I'm also not, not a Christian. And you could say that about any religion because personally, I feel like, um, well, I, I believe in a heavenly father and an earthly mother and that we each as humans have the, the birthright and, and the obligation to ourselves to explore a personal connection with the divine. Religions can help with that. Um, they can also hinder that depending on who's conducting them and sort of, my belief is that, um, you know, there's no limit on who can connect with a higher power um, that, you know, that the higher powers can speak many languages and appear in many forms. And I think it's just such a 
an essential part of being human, and that makes room for for a lot of things. Um, but I think that uh, you know what makes a cult different from a religion is that a cult tends to be more cancerous. You know that that a cult um, ultimately leads towards self destruction. A, a healthy role of re religion in someone's life gives them a particular language to speak with God in, because I, I believe God can speak any language, um, and this is a, a language or a culture that allows you that access that's meaningful for you um, if it's done in a healthy way. I also believe religions can be used in an abusive way. Um, but the cult-like aspect of things is sort of a distortion of our longing for the divine that channels it into uh, things that are self-destructive, that bring us away from community, away from health, away from the things that um, ultimately make life sustainable and help it to flourish. And that's why all cults ultimately end. Um, so that's that's more how I see this. And I think it's a distortion of the religious impulse um, and, and that it kind of fills a place, a void in people's lives. Because I think we live in a time that um, is quite atheist. And while I realize that that frees many people from the constraints and abuses of religions that have been unhelpful to them, um, it also leaves us in this void. And I think whenever, whenever there's that void, something will come rushing to fill it in. And that could be materialism. Um, it could be, you know, for, for many people, I think in different eras before the trans issue came up, it was an emphasis on, um, sort of the ego, right? Because if there's no higher power to connect to, then that longing for something grandiose is going, it's going to become fixated on the self. And so that could be about pursuit of wealth, fame, appearance, endless youth. Um, and now I think it's fixated on the, the narcissism of this concept of, of a gender identity and the fixation on the self there that really takes away from our ability to commune with something greater, whether that's a higher power and in any way that could be understood through a religion or whether that's um, community or values that are meaningful, that are ultimately productive. Yeah, I think that's that's well put. I mean, one way to think about this maybe is, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I kind of said a lot there. I went on this whole tangent explaining my, my view on no, spirituality. No, no, no. I, no, I, you, you made some really good points. And I wanted to say something. I just totally lost it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, maybe it'll come back. I mean, kind of religion versus yeah. cult. And, and you, mm. you came in in defense of religion. You were saying to compare gender ideology to a religion is kind of an insult to religion, which. Well, I just, th I, I just think it's not, it's, um, it doesn't have the, 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 the intellectual and spiritual depth of religion, even yeah. though it has some of its external trappings. Um, it has some superficial similarities to religion. Um, and certainly I, one point that you made, I think is definitely true. And that is that human beings have an, uh, the spirit, we have the spiritual side to us, right? Um, and the question is not whether we're, it's going to find an outlet, but which outlet it's going to find. And religion provides it with one outlet based on tradition that's it. based on a fixed body of experiences and and doctrines and beliefs that yes they change but very slowly and gradually and precisely for that reason they are uh, they, they speak to us and they're authoritative um i think that the, the fundamental uh mistake here is to is to assume that um transgenderism as a philosophical belief system is atheistic is secular it assuredly is not um, it, it's a kind of misdirection of the spiritual impulse into, into the, back down into the self, into yes. um, constant introspection and, um, and, and so, uh, you know, one way to think about, oh, now I remember, <laughs> one way to think about this, um, Freud said that we all have these sexual impulses, and I'm not a Freudian, but he said we, we all have these sexual impulses that if let loose are destructive for society, right? They, they, if we were to act upon our sexual impulses, civilization would be impossible. And so living in civilization requires paying a price, and that price is repression. We have to keep our impulses under control, and that's a painful thing to do. And, you know, you could say one way to think about the sexual revolution um, that came out of the 50s and 60s is that 
the, the premise of this revolution is that no, civilization is an irreversible achievement. We already have it in the back. And now in order to uh, kind of uh, perfect that achievement and, and uh, um, reach for a higher plane of existence, we need to let the sexual impulse, um, we, we need to unleash it um, because it's not dangerous at all. On the contrary, what's dangerous is repressing it, right? That's kind of the mantra of the sexual revolution. Um, and so we get, uh, through the fusion of German thought with American uh, kind of new left thought, we get the, the, the new ideal becomes authenticity. To be good means to be authentic. To be conformist means to be bad. And authenticity is undeniably the central value propelling the transgender movement. The problem is it's, there's nothing behind that value. There's nothing there. Authentic in what sense? To what purpose? Um, you know, Lyodel Trilling's book, Sincerity and Authenticity, in many, way, in many ways predicts what we're going through because one of the, the key arguments of that book is that authenticity has this kind of antisocial component to it. Um, whereas sincerity has embedded within it a concern for the common good. Um, authenticity is about doing what, doing your thing, right? Expressing your inner life outwardly, um, even when it offends public uh, social sensibilities, and especially when it offends social sensibilities. It means uh, showing that you are free of, ex of, of these social expectations and cultural assumptions, that you do, you do things your own way, that you're a truly free and liberated human being. Um, but there's no positive good there other than just flaunting and subverting. Um, and that's, that's not a prescription for a healthy society, and it's not even a prescription for a healthy human life. That's a, that's a prescription for a miserable life yeah. because human beings are social. We are social creatures. Yeah. We care deeply about the judgment of others. We care deeply about being on the good side of other people. And we want to merit our, uh, the good opinion that other people have of us, not just to force them to, to profess that they have good opinions about us. So, I mean, you know, when they say that the trans movement is nihilistic, I, I understand why to some people that sounds very bombastic and, and, and kind of too um, culture war-ish, um, but it's true. It is nihilistic. It doesn't have any positive value to, to put forward other than authenticity defined as doing whatever feels right to you. And that is not a prescription for a, for a good society or a well-lived human life. That's very well said. And it's reminding me, I was on a little getaway retreat this weekend with my partner to reflect and renew and refresh ourselves. And we got into this conversation about values because I think it's helpful to periodically revisit your values and see, you know, what are the values that are really guiding my life at this time? What are the values I'm longing to have a more active role in guiding my life? And what are the values that have maybe taken a back burner or started to expire? You know, the parts of my self-concept that, oh, I think I'm a person who really values this, but actually I haven't behaved that way in 10 years. Well, maybe that was my 20-something self and my priorities have changed, you know? So we we were making this list of values and I started coming, I started weaving these concepts together that values tend to come in pairs, like health and fitness, success and accomplishment, for instance and that each pair has its shadow. Um, so uh, honesty and integrity, I wrote them as a pair. And the shadow, I, I'm sorry, I have no better way to put it than being a dick. Um, so the shadow <laughs> of honesty, you know, we all know, we all know that person, um, to, to speak a different language here for a moment, it's like the Enneagram type eight personality for those who are into the Enneagram. Um, we all know that person, that you can count on for their blunt opinion, but you can't count on to, to soften it in any way, right? And taken to an extreme, that can be the person who's like, well, I'm just being honest, you know, but actually they're, they're either being honest in a way that's showing you their true colors, which is that they're callous and they don't care about you, or they're being honest and they're not really a dick, but they're leaving out half the story. Because, you know, it might be that half the story is this is what I really think about you and this thing I don't like about you, right? But the other half of the story is 
that I'm, I am worried about how that's going to make you feel. And I don't want you to feel disrespected by me. And I also want you to know that I appreciate all these other things about you or that these things that annoy me about you are in the context of me seeing how difficult this is for you or how those exist in balance with other needs that you have. You know, there's always more to the story if you're not truly a horrible person. <laughs> and so um, there's, I, I hear you kind of talking about that shadow, right? There's this valuing of so-called authenticity. And I think we could question whether it is truly authentic because a lot of it seems honestly really performative and attention seeking and empty inside. Um, but even supposing that this movement was really about authenticity or right, that it's not existing in harmony and balance with all the other values that make us human, including our the value that we place on connection and our ability to be receptive to other people, for example, and our need to navigate you know, if my authenticity looks like being ostentatious and doing something, let's say, deliberately provocative, like let's say um, classic example would be like a drag queen, a drag queen, if that is the drag queen's quote unquote authentic self, who can say, but it's certainly, you know, that person is showing us that their true colors are that they like to make other people uncomfortable. So it's like, are you showing us that your authentic self is sadistic because that's kind of the vibe I'm getting. And if someone being authentic, whatever that means to them, means that they're sadistic or that they are, you know, taking pleasure in making other people uncomfortable, then maybe my authentic truth is that I want to get the hell away from them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're putting your finger on some of the problems, the civic problems of a culture that valorizes authenticity. Um, I, I, I try to avoid the language of values because the language of values is itself um, kind of an outgrowth of this nihilistic philosophy. Um, principles is or virtues, vices, right sure. and wrong. I mean, those, <laughs> that's the, but but uh, no. I mean, your 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 basic point to get beyond language. Your basic point is is of course correct. Um, I mean, part of this is you know we've seen this huge transformation in uh, progressive education over the past century and how kids are raised, especially in schools, but also uh, in the family. Um, where once, you know, things like self-esteem were thought to come to a person by virtue of their merit as demonstrated in objective, socially desirable um, tests, whether it's tests of intelligence or tests of um, athletic aptitude or tests of, of moral courage um, and altruism, whatever, whatever it is, um, nobody deserves self-esteem. Nobody has the right to self-esteem. Self-esteem is something that you, that you acquire, that you, that you earn. Um, now, under progressive education today, and I think that this characterizes 95 plus percent of um, schools, K through 12 schools um, across the country, including many religious schools, including schools that many, many parents, I think, falsely assume are, are more conservative. Um, now, the, you know, the, the, the uh, progressive education today says, no, self-esteem is, is, is a birthright. Everybody, every child deserves to have self-esteem. Uh, self and the fact that if, you know, that um, not all kids are born super intelligent and with uh, extraordinary athletic capacity and with, um, you know, extraordinary capacity for courage or things like that means that we have to tailor the requirements of self-esteem to each individual according to what they already have inside of them, right? So you get this ideal of expressive individualism, that, that the truly good thing is the thing that's already inside of you, that doesn't need to be cultivated, that doesn't need to be um, uh, uh, chiseled um, and worked on, um, and, and that's, you know, that, that's a recipe for, for social decay, not social growth. That's a recipe for decay, moral decay, social decay. And this is, we're already like far beyond the trans issue, right? Because this issue touches uh, on so many other aspects of, of, of civic life, of public life. I agree. Um, and can we go that just, I'm so excited yeah. by this conversation and I know we're, yeah. we have to wrap it up soon. So it just reminds me of just something I'll mention briefly, which is, have you read... Uh, Louise Perry's 
book, uh, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. No, not yet, it no. came out this year and it's it's excellent. Maybe you've seen some of her her interviews. But um, you know, here here's like an uncomfortable set of truths to explore would be when um when sex is endlessly abundant or the illusion of having sex is endlessly abundant through pornography, right? What to speak of sex work and so on. Um, what is what are the consequences for society? Right. And one is if you think about the dopamine and reward system and how sex, you know, especially for males, sex is like, yay, I did it. I achieved, I achieved it. I achieved something, right? The thing I'm going after. And every society has had its own standards for what you do to make yourself more attractive or desirable as a mate um, for each gender role, for each sex role. Um, but you know, typically there's there's some expectation in each society that stood the test of time that in order to secure a mate, a male would have to do things like build a career, build financial security, create a home, create a good reputation, take care of his health, achieve something, maybe be creative, be funny, play an instrument, you know, anything, but just like build yourself up in some way. And then also, depending on the society, commit to a woman, offer her marriage, offer her the security that she needs, right? And so in more traditional conservative societies where let's say um, there was no sex before marriage, sex is very scarce, and then men have to work very hard to uh, to secure sex. And, and the ramifications for society are positive because men are creating lucrative businesses and secure families and homes and they're sticking around as fathers. And so what happens when... Um, you know, you can get the milk for free, so to speak. When when there's pornography, when there's sex work, things like this, what are the consequences? Well, if the dopamine system is kind of being hijacked into thinking, I've achieved it. I've gotten what, you know, my, my evolutionary drive, you know, problem solved, and you haven't actually made anything of yourself, then, then what are the ripple effects of that? Um, so that's like a whole other conversation, but I'm just... I'm so, I'm sad that we have to wrap up soon, and there are more questions for you on Twitter. But I'm wondering if I should run any of them by you, or if we should just try to wrap it up. Um, if there's a short one, we can address a short one. Uh, well, I'll just list them, and you can say you okay. can name if there's any of them that you okay. want to respond to. Okay, Bob Casamacus says, "What advice for parents in schools that do not respect sex-specific spaces like bathrooms or locker rooms?" Gender critical parent says. Perhaps the Ninth Circuit case and what orgs or strategy might be up for staging an intervention here in Oregon, as has been done in Florida. Medical industry self-regulation is not happening as it should. Um, ordinary binary guy says you should both talk about suicide threats from adolescents and the support they receive from experts. I feel like all of those are at least 10 minute conversations. <laughs> well, I, let, let me just address the first one because I think okay. that's uh, fairly easily address and that right. um what to do about what can parents do about schools that don't respect sex sex based spaces um one option is to just get into the whole debate about privacy and you know boundaries and things like that and that you know we've seen in federal litigation that tends to go nowhere and i i think most schools are not gonna uh are not gonna respect that too much unfortunately um i think more effective yeah, especially now, um, for reasons I'll say in just a minute, is to explain to school officials that allowing students to, uh, first of all, addressing them in their desired names and pronouns and allowing them to use the spaces that they want to use, sex-specific spaces, is not just an innocent act of kindness, innocent display of kindness and compassion. That is a social transition. Full stop. In fact, the ACLU has said that explicitly in its lawsuits, that changing a, a student's name and pronouns and, and letting them use the, their desired bathrooms is social transition. The difference is that now we know that social transition is iatrogenic, meaning it greatly increases the chance that what would normally, typically, prove to be a passing phase is going to settle as an identity and put a child on a medical pathway. So the, the big challenge, as I see it, over the next couple of years is, gonna be, is, is to persuade or, or inform teachers and school administrators that what they think is just a simple act of compassion and inclusivity is an active form of psychosocial mental health intervention for which they are not qualified. 
Yeah. Um, the UK recently acknowledged this. It issued new draft guidance. The NHS issued new draft guidance saying that social transition in children is strongly discouraged because of its iatrogenic consequences. And even for teenagers, the NHS is now saying it should only be done for, uh, for those who have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, and even then only on the basis of informed consent. If American schools were to take that advice seriously, overnight they would get rid of 95% of their inclusion policies. Because the, the, the practical effect of all of those school policies is to socially transition students on demand, with or without their parents even knowing about it. That's so very well said. Thank you so much for that, Lior, and to to Bob, as well as anyone else listening who's curious about this question. I would definitely recommend, as I mentioned earlier, of course, following Lior, um, but also following Courage as a Habit, Christina Buttons. Um, Gabrielle Clark, I believe, has like a tutorial you can buy for some low fee that guides you through the process that she went through inviting her daughter's school district, if I recall correctly. Um, Deb Philman, uh, the reason we learn YouTube channel, she does great work. I've been on her show. Uh, she's, she will be on a future episode of mine. Um, so definitely check out those other resources for, you know, other people who are having these types of conversations about what to do with the school stuff. Lior, I want to respect your time. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I feel like there's so much more we could talk about. Um, but it's been almost two hours already. Um, so where can people find you? Uh, well, my writings you can find on my page in the Manhattan Institute. So if you just Google my name, Manhattan Institute, you'll find all of my writings there, uh, including ones that are not at City Journal. But um, if you want a, a more immediate follow, you can um, follow me on Twitter. And my handle, let me just make sure I'm getting this right because I never ever, I have a need to... <laughs> okay, my handle is at Lior Sapir. So that's just my full name, L-E-O-R-S-A-P-I-R, at Lior Sapir, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I hope everyone gives you a follow and really appreciate the work you're doing. Best of luck. Thank you, Stephanie. You as well. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast with Stephanie Wynn, LMFT. This podcast is produced by Eric and Amber Beals at Different Mix. Special thanks to the talented musician Joey Pecorero for our theme song, Half Awake. At SomeTherapist.com, you can find more information on any topic, guest, resource, product, or service you've heard of here today. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at SomeTherapist. If you would like to ask a question, suggest a topic, be a guest, or invite me to speak, you can email us at hello at SomeTherapist.com. You can also send us a voice memo with your question, and we just might play it. Of course, just because I'm some therapist doesn't mean I'm your therapist. This podcast is not a substitute for medical advice. If you need help, ask your doctor or browse your local therapists online. And whatever you do next, please take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, move your body, get outside, and tell someone you love them. You're worth it.